Welcome everyone to AGI's GeoWebinar series. My name is Lila Gonzalez and I'll be moderating today's Geoscience Currents Discussion webinar, Geoscience Academic Provenance. Today we'll be hearing from Heather Holton from AGI's Workforce Program. She'll be discussing her recent set of Geoscience Currents pertaining to her master's thesis research on Geoscience Academic Provenance and her pathway model for recruiting and retaining students in the geosciences. I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsor for this webinar, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, and we'd like to thank them for promoting this webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Heather, so Heather, go ahead. Thank you, Mila, for the introduction. My name is Heather Holton, and I will be presenting today about geoscience academic provenance, which is the research that I completed for my master's project at Purdue University. If you are interested in reading more, you can actually download it from the link listed here. So we'll start with an overview. First, what is academic provenance? It is taking students' initial interests, their experiences, decisions, and future goals and mapping them temporally to find relationships between each. It creates this geoscience pathway that each student follows that leads them into the major. Few studies have actually found relationships between these components that address the growing issue of recruitment and retention in the geosciences, and these efforts have become increasingly important. Approximately half of the existing geoscience workforce will reach retirement age within the next 10 years, yet the number of geoscience graduates entering the profession has remained low, despite the increased demand and competitive salaries that the geosciences offer. So now I will briefly review the traditional pipeline model and compare and contrast it to the new pathway model that I developed during my graduate research. A pipeline model has been established in the STEM community as a metaphor for how students enter into and exit out of a discipline. It has been used as a framework for many diversity and recruitment and retention studies in the geosciences. However, it fails to distinguish between different entry and exit points. Specifically, one study by Levine et al. identified critical incidents within the geoscience pipeline that influenced individuals to enter the profession. You may be wondering what critical incidents are. They are specific experiences or events that influence an individual to make certain choices and behavior. And today we'll be looking at those critical incidents that are responsible for why students choose the geoscience major. Now looking at the pathway model, this differs from the pipeline model and that it shows the relationships between different events and students' experiences. Unlike the pipeline model that just simply generates lists of critical incidents, the pathway model establishes a temporal sequence of events and decisions that students faced in the pursuit of their degree. So in my research, I identified six pathway steps that students followed, and each step has several components that describe students' trajectories. Components include students' interests, their experiences, decisions, motivations, and their goals. Here you can see um, are the six pathway steps that students experience in their pursuit of a degree or a career. First, the innate attributes and interest sources are the intrinsic attributes about students' personalities that are aligned with geoscience-related subjects. Now, there aren't always point sources, but rather they can be generalized interest or awareness of a geoscience-related topic. The next two steps explain the critical incidents that students experienced. They were either prior to college, as in the orange pre-college critical incidents, or they happened during college in the yellow step. The fourth step, the current or near future goals, are those that students were focused on obtaining at the time of the interviews. The expected career attributes are those qualities that students thought geoscience careers would have. Now, these don't necessarily reflect the actual characteristics of the professions, but rather students' perceptions of those careers. And finally, the last step, students indicated what geoscience careers they have considered, what they were pursuing, or what they know are available to them with a geoscience degree. And these are those desired career choices in the purple step. I found two types of critical incidents in my study that acted on behavior in different ways. Traditionally, critical incidents are either positive or negative influence. However, since my research was focused on identifying those critical incidents that resulted in students entering and remaining in the geoscience major, they were all positive influences. 
Thus, I was able to distinguish subtleties in how they influence students' decision to major in the two sciences. The first were supportive critical incidents. These confirmed or reinforced students' decisions and kept them on the path that they were following. The second were the behavior-altering critical incidents, which served as strong influences towards making the decision to major in the geosciences. Here are some examples of supportive versus behavioral-altering critical incidents. The first quote talks about how the student was slightly unsure of this choice, but that the geoscience class was a positive experience. The second quote is from a student whose intent to pursue the geosciences originated from watching Dante's Peak, a sci-fi movie about a volcanic eruption. In the first quote, you can see that the student's earth science class confirmed the decision to major in the geosciences. It was that reinforcing experience. Whereas in the second example, this student never even considered being a volcanologist as a real career until a movie came out about it. It wasn't until then that the student thought it was an actual profession that was obtainable. Looking at this graph, it shows how many students cited each critical incident. There were a total of 14 identified, as you can see from the bottom axis. The orange bars indicate pre-college critical incidents, whereas the yellow indicate the college critical incidents. In the center of the graph, notice that taking a geoscience course or lab and the teacher and professor influence are the highest cited incidents collectively. Taking a course or lab mostly occurred while the students were in college, thus demonstrating the importance of introductory level courses. Looking at the teacher-professor influence now, notice how these predominantly acted as behavior-altering incidents and occurred both before and during college. This reiterates the importance of quality geoscience teachers and faculty throughout students' academic careers. The next prominent critical incident to note is the previous major induces a behavioral change, which is the tall yellow bar on the right. These are a collection of experiences that students had while majoring in other disciplines that made them want to switch out of that major and into the geosciences. This critical incident can only act as a behavioral altering incident to college students, and I will explain a little bit more about this later on in my talk. So now that you're familiar with these pathway steps and some of these critical incidents, I will talk about another very important finding in my research. So after analysis of each student's pathway steps, I was able to categorize my participants into populations based on their pathway trajectories. Natives are students who decide to major in the geosciences before or at the time of enrollment into college. That's why they are native to the major. Out of the 17 total participants, there were seven students who were categorized as natives. Immigrants, on the other hand, are students in a different major when they enter college and eventually switch into the geosciences. There were nine students who immigrated into the geoscience major. The last population group, the refugees, they seek refuge in the major and they do not intend on pursuing a career in the discipline after graduating. Refugees choose the major only as a means to an end. Thankfully, one, only one student was classified as a refugee, and he was considered as more of an outlier of all of the data points. So now that we've defined the three population groups, we'll look at each of their pathways. This is the full pathway for the native geoscience students. Notice the geoscience focus of the innate attributes and interest sources. They're all basically geoscience specific. The pre-college pathway step in orange has two particularly interesting critical incidents. The confirmation of geoscience ability is specific to the native geoscience students. Students applied geoscience knowledge to an everyday experience or while problem solving, and they were successful in the task's completion. It demonstrates that these students had positive self-efficacy towards the geosciences, thus encouraging them to pursue this pathway. The second critical incident I want to draw your attention to is the teacher-professor influence. This incident only occurs in the pre-college pathway step for the native population. 
It emphasizes the importance that K-12 teachers have on the geoscience discipline. Now, even though teacher-professor influence was found as a pre-college critical incident, taking a course or a lab doesn't appear in the pathway until college. This emphasizes the importance of college courses that support geoscience majors and their interests. This also shows us a potential weakness in our discipline. K-12 curriculum and courses fail to get students interested in pursuing the major at all. Now, looking at the expected career attributes in blue, these are the attributes that students believe the geoscience careers will have. But in particular, the natives think that geoscience careers will be lucrative, which, as you can see, is well aligned with the desired career choices that they cite in purple. Here's the pathway for geoscience immigrant students. At first glance, you can notice that there are a wider variety of pathway components. This can be attributed to the fact that these students have more varied academic backgrounds than natives. Immigrants have more generalized innate attributes and interest sources that do not always pertain to the geosciences, but rather to science in general. And looking specifically at the college critical incidents, the previous major induced behavioral change applies only to the immigrants. These are those experiences in other disciplines that made students reassess their academic careers to switch majors. Right. Now, referring back to the critical incident graph, this incident was by far the most commonly cited, indicating that not only do immigrants have to have these initial interests, but they need an external motivator to make them reassess what they were doing. They won't typically come to the geosciences on their own. And as you can see, seven out of the nine immigrants needed this extra push. Now moving on to the last population group, this is an example of a refugee pathway. This pathway is less detailed than the others, and it shows a lack of direction. The initial interests are similar to those of the other populations, but the pathway is indicative of the students studying the geosciences just as a last resort. Because natives and immigrants intend on pursuing geoscience careers, we will look specifically at how the two pathways compare, and this figure illuminates those similarities between them. We see a general interest and awareness, as well as a hobby of collecting rocks, which actually many students cited in their interviews. There were only two common critical incidents before college, whereas there were three common ones during college, and they all pertain to school or academics in some way. Clearly obtaining good grades and going to grad school are common goals, but this might actually be indicative of my sample population. Those students who are willing to participate in a voluntary study may actually be more likely to have aspirations of good grades and continued education because those tend to be the more motivated students. The last common pathway components are the career attributes, and these are very general aspects that students would like in a career, yet, importantly, they don't have any desired careers in common. So by utilizing this information effectively, departments can develop or refine strategies for recruiting and retaining students who are more likely to consider the major. Those students who have these interests, they have these experiences, and are looking towards these goals and career attributes may have a higher probability of becoming a geoscientist. Notice how the epiphany of geoscience perspective of time and space occurs in both incident pathway steps. These, these are the most important, like, aha moments, the light bulb moments that students experience when learning the geoscience content. Now, facilitating these moments of really deep understanding of geoscience concepts may serve as an effective trigger. Looking at the blue box of expected career attributes, these are the aspects that many students hope to experience in their future careers, but it's regardless of what they're pursuing. So, bringing an alumni or other geoscience professionals into the classroom to speak about career opportunities and these career attributes, it may help reinforce students' persistence in the major. Now let's look at the differences between our two population groups. Geoscience students' entry points into the major is the primary difference between natives and immigrants. Natives enter the major earlier than immigrants do which indicates that their pre-college critical incidents are more influential and effective. Incorporating engagement activities and lessons geared towards introducing students to these types of experiences prior to college 
may provide the impetus for them to consider a geoscience major. An example of this uh, might be geoscience outreach activities at local high schools or even with the community. Immigrants have a high sense of self-efficacy with the confirmation of geoscience ability, as do natives, but for immigrants, this experience doesn't occur until they're in college. For most immigrants, it isn't until their previous major induced a behavioral change that they actually thought about adding a geoscience major. Now, drawing your attention to the future time steps of the pathways, we see the divergence between natives and immigrants. Natives are pursuing careers that they believe will be lucrative. This perception is consistent with their desired career choices, which are mostly in industry and government. However, immigrants have a more altruistic view of the geosciences. They are the ones who want to make the global impacts. They want to teach and they want to continue to learn. And these attributes are also reflected in their desired career choices. Immigrants want to primarily stay in academia or do research. So overall, geoscientists from different sectors can use this information to target certain geoscience student populations that may fit the needs of their profession. This theoretical framework goes beyond that pipeline model, and it is the first study to fully map geoscience students' pathways into and out of the major. The distinct populations that I identified in my research, the natives, immigrants, and refugees, they can be applied to other STEM disciplines for recruitment and retention studies. And since the geoscience populations are following different pathway trajectories, the information can be used to inform different geoscience sectors' recruitment and retention initiatives. And previous studies on critical incidents and these efforts have similar findings, so thus, this study just adds to the growing body of literature on the topic. In future research, I am currently in the process of collecting new data from these same students about their current status. I'm inquiring about what they're doing now, what goals they're working toward, and about their desired future careers. And I would like to understand how and why their pathways have changed, if at all, and what causes deviations from geoscience pathways and attrition from the geoscience discipline. So this is the end of my talk, and I just wanted to thank you all for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, again, here's the link to my thesis if you are interested in downloading the PDF. And uh, I thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Heather. Um, so now we'll go ahead and move into our uh, panel discussion. So as participants, again, we'll keep you muted, but you can start asking um, questions. Go ahead and type them into your question or chat box on your webinar panel, and we'll start fielding them now. Um, Heather, that's, thanks again for presenting your research today. Absolutely. And we have some good questions coming in already, and I just want to start Jumping into our panel discussion, um, you've done some really amazing work here on looking at indicators that recruit and retain students in the geosciences. Uh, do you have any future plans for examining those type of critical incidents that actually cause students to leave the geoscience major? Yeah, actually I do. Um, in my follow-up study that I just mentioned, um, I have survey questions about why students decide to leave the discipline, um, and that would really give us some great insight into attrition rates. Um, however, so far with the data that I've collected, all of my participants have actually stayed in the major. So um, it really, obtaining that information really depends on um, if a respondent has left the major or if they've decided to stay. So we'll see how that pans out. Great, great, great. Um, also, another question that we've got here, you've given some great examples of what departments can do to target these cohorts of students. Now I know we've got AGI's GeoWebinar series that has some careers, you know, what can you do with a geoscience career? Their webinars, um, I know you mentioned in-person contact with the students, but would these online resources be useful or would that also feed into targeting different student groups and how can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So really, um, one of the interesting points that I found is a lot of my students didn't have very much information about careers when they were considering the major. A lot of times the natives were the ones who had a lot of information on the careers and so they kind of did their background research, whereas the immigrants, once they got into their intro classes and they got a little bit more interested, they didn't have that career information to begin with. So um, finding online um, activities or information 
is actually going to be really important for kind of hooking those natives. And if you would go to um, AGI's professional society websites, they actually have a lot of websites devoted to careers and giving students that type of information. Right. Okay, and let's see. Wow, we've got lots of questions coming in here. Let's just take a look. Um, one question for you is, did you include two-year institutions in your study? No, I didn't actually. My study only covered um, two institutions. They were Midwest main big research um, colleges, and um, they had somewhat comparable departments. So um, out of my participants, they were fairly... Um, similar in terms of their diversity and their population groups. Great. Um, one, one other question we've got here is, if I were a professor in a intro class, mm -hmm. um, is there an easy way for me to identify these different student cohorts? I know you talked about natives are already native to the major, but you know, those refugees or those uh, immigrants, natives, should I do a survey? Should I? Are there distinct things I should look for in that interclass to help me identify different populations so that can hook them appropriately into the right, major? Right. Well, going back to the definitions, um, the natives are the students who start in the major. So if you go to your department, you can actually see which students have declared their major early on, um, whether they be freshmen or sophomores, depending on how the departments are set up. So those typically would be your they're your native students. The immigrants are a little bit tricky um, because a lot of the immigrants got hooked in their intro classes. They really came from a lot of different places. Um, a lot of them came from engineering courses, some social sciences, math, physics. So um, there's a broad spread of interests there. So to hook them, um, that's why it's important to have really enthusiastic geoscience teachers in those intro courses and labs and activities. And so hopefully the students who would potentially immigrate immigrate into the geoscience major are those who are asking questions, they're really involved, they're enthusiastic. In terms of the refugees, um, these students don't really have intentions on pursuing a, the geosciences long term, so you may not really want to, you know, they're not as important to the field because it, they may take more coursing um, and they may actually not make the best students either. Yeah, so it might be a little too much investment for... Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's take a look at some of the other questions coming in here. <clears throat> so you seem to focus on <clears throat> geoscience majors. Have you done anything with non-science majors and how to reach them? No, I actually haven't. Um, this, this study, um, I wanted to specifically focus only on geoscience majors um, because we haven't actually ever mapped out where they come from. Um, and so I found it was important because we have such so few geoscience majors to begin with. We wanted to get a good framework and a good idea of who they are first because they come from so many different places. And so setting up that framework was really um, the focus of my thesis. Okay, that's great. Um, just to follow up on the two-year question, mm -hmm. um, for those students that you worked with at the four-year universities, in your questionnaires or surveys of them, did you ask them if they attended community college or any two-year institutions? I did not ask that question, but from my interviews, most of them had not. Okay. And actually, just from remembering the data, I don't remember any students indicating that they had come from a community college setting. Um, there were some transfers, but they had also been at four-year institutions prior to that. So they had maybe attended community college to take a fulfill general education requirements for? I don't remember anyone okay. even saying anything about oh, community colleges. Oh, other four-year institutions. Yeah, actually. so they started okay. other universities and then they, they transferred to my university or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where did you find that most of your immigrants came from? And can you talk a little bit about those critical incidents? You, you talked about this push out of their major. What majors mm -hmm. did they come from and, and what were those incentives that push them into geoscience and out of their major? Yeah, um, actually, out of my nine immigrants, um, a good chunk of them were actually engineers. <clears throat> so, and this, this data may be slightly skewed to my sample population for what universities I sampled, but um, engineering was really a big previous major. Um, a lot of students found that engineering, it either had too much work it was too hard, they lost interest, um, it was too competitive. 
Um, and so those were kind of the incentives that pushed them out. And if they had these previous um, interests, they're like, well, why not? Why not geology? Why can't I pursue geoscience? Um, other um, disciplines included physics. There were a couple physics, um, physics teaching. There was a couple math. Um, so they really did mostly come from STEM disciplines. There was one social science. I think it was psychology. <coughs> and other than that, I think it was mostly on science disciplines. <laughs> we got lots more questions. So again, as participants, feel free to keep typing your questions in, and we will um, continue to read them <laughs> off as we have time. Here's one for you, Heather. Um, for the natives, what experiences did they have within their K through 12 education that was most influential <coughs> to pursuing their college career in the geosciences? What mm -hmm. what did they experience pre-college that drove them to choose geoscience right off the bat? A lot of them actually had these um, pre-college courses. Um, there were a couple students who, in their um, middle school and high school classes, had phenomenal teachers, and it was like these one-on-one -on -one interactions that really provided those those experiences. So mostly it was mentorship, actually. Um, great, thank you for that. We've got a few more questions here, and. One of them is, do you know if there are colleges and universities that are having success implementing recruitment strategies to high schools? You know, Just from your research or what you've been able to pull together? Yeah. I haven't actually heard of many initiatives that way, um, just because my framework is so new right now. Um, we're still in the stages of refining it and learning more about like how it can be applied. Mm -hmm. But I do know of some brand new studies that are um, hopefully starting to go on within the past year or so and they're going to hopefully be using this framework as a starting point um, to look at various regions around the country because really this framework and my results are very specific to the Midwest and what I found with my two universities. So um, being able to apply this would really come in handy once we have more data from around the country and using this framework in different regions and under different circumstances. Right. It might also be interesting, um, I know we've done some previous geo-webinars um, on geoscience courses where universities such as the ESOP program up at um, SUNY Oneonta, they have an outreach program for mm -hmm. geosciences where they teach geoscience courses at the high school level and high mm -hmm. school students get university credit for that. So, and I know there are a few universities around the U.S. that are doing similar type programs, so mm -hmm. it would be interesting to take your research yeah. and, and to connect you with those universities to kind of yeah, see how that works. Um, yeah, to see if great. that would even bring in more native, native students into the major. For the native populations, was any one specific discipline um, within the geosciences is that they chose as a profession? Did any one career option mm -hmm. pop out as a primary mm -hmm. goal that they had that they wanted to pursue? Um, you know, a lot of my students varied in age. I I interviewed students from freshmen all the way through seniors. So a, the majority of my students were juniors, and so they had a little better idea of what they were pursuing, but they're still a little bit wishy-washy because they had a year left. Um, but of those that were mentioned, I think the most common were um, oil and gas, actually, for the natives. Um, there were a couple men. There was like a one mention of mining. Um, maybe one mention of environmental work, but the majority was oil and gas, and actually the highest cited desired career was unknown. So most students didn't really know what they wanted to do yet, um, but of the students that did know, they were pursuing oil and gas. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about your data collection and your instrument development? for your survey, just to give us an overview. I know everybody can go and download your thesis and, and read through that in detail, but can you just yeah. give us a brief overview of how you developed your surveys and yeah, absolutely. your data? So um, if you do download my thesis, I have my interview protocol um, in the back appendix, so you can always look at those questions. But I basically developed my interview protocol um, as a critical incident study, um, and I 
I modeled my study initially after uh, Levine's article that I mentioned early in my talk here. And so using that critical incident methodology was really important to me because it allowed me to really drive at these very specific experiences that students had that made them make decisions. And so that way, once I had these specific decisions, I could order them and I could find um, how they all related to each other. So that was really um, the approach that I took in gathering my data. And your students were mostly undergraduate? They were all undergraduates, yeah. Okay. They were all undergraduates. They ranged from freshmen to seniors. Um, and they were all geoscience majors. That was the, the primary focus. So your age range was kind of between 18 and 22, yeah. more or less? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they were all traditional students as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's all of our questions for today's webinar. Um, thank you for sending in all these great discussion points. If you have any questions that were not addressed today, please email them to us at workforce at agiweb.org, and Heather will get back to you directly. This concludes our webinar for today, and Heather, I'd like to again thank you for sharing your research with us. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for this opportunity. Absolutely. And I'd also like to thank our co-sponsor once again, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, um, and thank them for promoting this webinar. Thank you all, and have a good day.